Bedouin people that have names like Fir'aun because you know their dad just went in the Quran and looked for a name like to, for Tabarruk <laughs> he said Fir'aun that's a good name Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala Ali wa sahbihi wa salam tasliman kathira wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah al-ali al-azim Allahumma iftah alayna hikmatak wa anshur alayna rahmatak ya dhal jalali wa rikram وصلي لهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الكرام ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله the uh, just before I talk there are a couple of things I wanted to uh, mention um, one of them is about cameras the um, there's a couple of people that are doing things officially, which I don't have any problem with. But um, I think people, something very strange has happened in my lifetime, um, which is the complete ubiquitous, ubiquitous nature of uh, the camera and this idea that everybody can take pictures of anybody they want to and take the image of a person and then put it up on Facebook or do whatever they want with it um, as if individual images don't seem to have any meaning whatsoever. Um, you know, a lot of the early scholars were very opposed to photography when it first came into the, the Muslim world and um, wrote very extensively about it. It was a major issue that was debated and the ulama settled on two different opinions which they often do. One is the, the Rukhsa and the other is the Shidda. And this is the Mizan of the Sharia, this balance between these taking a, a more rigorous position and taking an easier, gentler position. But even the people that took the easier position, if you look at the early fatwas, which I did a long time ago, but they were very interesting. Um, they tended to argue things like the usefulness of these things for science, and for teaching people. They, they didn't talk about um, just taking pictures of everything for no reason. Um, and one of the things I think that's happening to people, and I'm talking to the more younger people here, is that you'll tend to miss experiences because you're in this kind of mediated reality that uh, you have to film for some reason. Um, and you'll, you'll just miss those experiences. Um, so, you know, you go to the, 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 the great mosque today and the imam's giving a khutbah and there's all these people like filming it and taking pictures uh, during the khutbah, which I think would have really shocked earlier people. They just wouldn't have understood what you were doing. Um, but it's, it's just something that I want people really to think about. Um, the idea of just taking candid pictures that, um, you know. If you look at one of the interesting things about 19th century photography is almost every single picture you will ever see, you'll never see anybody smiling in those pictures. You will not see candid pictures. You'll always see people in an incredibly dignified mode. Even gangsters, like if you look at pictures of Billy the Kid, or somebody from that period, they're standing and they're upright and, they're, and they're, they're trying to look their best because it's a permanent frozen image of that person and those people, even the worst of them, had a sense of dignity and a sense of what permanence was and what it meant. So this idea of taking pictures when people are eating, you know, I mean, I was literally having dinner uh, and somebody would start taking pictures and I just, I said, you know, the Tuareg actually wear a veil when they eat because they consider it a very private thing, eating. Um, so I just want people to be a little more conscientious about that thing. I would prefer no cameras in, in this uh, uh, room uh, unless you're really authorized to, to do that. Um, and I, and I would really beware of, like I, I haven't, I've never carried a camera. I've never taken pictures on any of the trips. I've been all over the world. And, and I had a Moroccan, uh, you know, a, a Moroccan, um, one of the uh, fuqara in Meknes. 
and everybody wanted to take a picture and he, he just he clicked his heart you know he said that's where his camera was right? just to click the heart you don't really need to have these images you know I was there right? you, don't, you don't have to have that image So, there, I mean, there's just so many images in the world now. That's all, it's just flooded. And, and you have to wonder where it's all going. You know, where is this all going? Just nadar lil ma'alat. Where is it all going? The, the internet's just filled with endless images of everything. And the image is losing its meaning. And, you know, I would recommend reading Neil Postman's book, Amusing Ourselves to Death especially the second chapter in that book, which is about image-based societies. And one of the things that he reflects on in that book is why God would make it a prohibition to make graven images in the Decalogue, in the Ten Commandments. Why would making graven images be a prohibition? And he argues that any society that is going to be a society of abstraction and imagination then the worst thing for a society like that is to produce images. It would be the worst thing. And so if you want to have an abstraction, because God is a complete abstraction, you cannot imagine God. And so if you want to inculcate in a people the ability to have the highest abstractions, then the preference for that would be not to have images. And so the early... Muslims were very, very uh, strong about that. And the iconoclastic movement in the Orthodox Church, which was centered here, uh, because of their interaction with the Muslims and that seriousness with which they took that prohibition of taswir, of graven images, um, the Christians started destroying all of their icons and it's interesting that the only icons that we have from that period are the ones that were in monasteries that were in the Muslim lands because they were protected from these fanatical iconoclasts who were going around into all the churches and destroying all the images of the Greek Orthodox uh, icons during that period but that response was a response from interacting with Muslims and you can see this also during the Protestant period where they went and smashed all the idols in the Catholic churches or the images rather. Um, so I'm not, you know, I'm not saying don't take pictures. Uh, people can do that. I'm just saying there's times when it's, it might be useful to think about putting the camera down and just experiencing something, not necessarily through a mediated reality. And that's partly why there's a, a photographer here doing this to do that. I mean, that's why they brought him here so that there, there would be images and, and things like that from this. So that's just, you know, those, that's my own uh, peevish perspective about uh, this, this thing. Um, food for thought. That's all. So he deals with the eye at the end of this uh, poem, but we're dealing with the tongue now. So uh, so he says, "Kada hikayat kada hikayat maqara nataqi fi jambr anbiya bi ghairi laiqi." This is uh, on the prohibition of saying anything that has been said about any of the prophets that is not ghair uh, laiq that is not appropriate and shouldn't be said about them. The, uh, this includes cursing them and you will find statements made obviously in, in, in the Old Testament you'll find statements made about certain prophets that are completely unacceptable from a Muslim perspective. The idea that a prophet would send a man into battle to be killed so that he could covet his wife. Even an average person wouldn't do that let alone one of the best of uh, God's creation or the idea that a prophet could uh, sleep with his daughters or the I mean all of these things are mentioned and there's no 
it's prohibited to talk about these things unless it was in a teaching situation to warn people even if it's mentioned in the Quran and he'll mention that about Adam alayhi uh, salam so he says ma lam yusuqu gharadun shar'i so if there's a gharadun shar'iyu if there's a sharia reason for doing it lahu ka an yahdharu ghabiyu so for instance so that somebody who's not very uh, intelligent can avoid it the rabbi uh, somebody who's you know might not realize how serious that is so you have to tell somebody like that uh, to warn them kadaka an yaquda fi ghayri tila wa tin'asa adamu rabbuhu ala so also to say in other than recitation there's a verse in the quran that says that adam disobeyed his lord and he says uh, in the commentary he says you shouldn't ever say that about your own father let alone the father of humanity but because it's in the quran and allah says that and it doesn't mean isyan uh, disobedience in the sense of a willful disobedience according to the dominant opinion of the the scholars so that's very important because there's a lot of things and he'll talk about later in the text he will talk about interpreting the quran from your opinion or what it appears linguistically to mean so in the quran there are many things that uh, the 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 apparent linguistic meaning of it is actually different from the actual meaning of it and if you if you just interpret that it says that asa adam so if you just take that purely linguistically it means one thing but you have to understand what the commentary is and this is why the ulama prohibit it and he'll get into that so he's saying other than in tadawa you should not do that wadhkuru an laqa nabiyun kadara ma lam yakun rawiyan aw mudhakira or to talk about the things that happen to the uh, the the prophets uh, in the world Uh, again as long as you're not relating it as a riwaya or about uh, telling it as some uh, the mudhakara of the ulama uh, who know about these things and so it's important there's things that are uh, mentioned in the hadith and in the quran that happened to prophets and it's inappropriate to talk about those things unless there's a reason to do that famous story of Musa alayhi salam Uh, when his clothes were stolen from him uh, things like that if there's if there's not a reason for doing it then just to talk about something like that uh, is not acceptable and he says lil ulama wa nahwuhum mimman la yakhafu an yasma'uhu an yadilla in yasma'uhu an yadilla so this is the ulama can do this or the students their students those who if they hear it they won't go astray because of it so there's things that you can hear Uh, that uh, could lead a person astray and one of the things about sira is very important to remember that sira the early sira especially ibn hisaq ibn ishaq is sira is the weakest form of narration in islamic tradition like the history akhbar and sira these are very weak forms of uh, narrative unless they have a sanad muttasil and the early ulama collected everything because they're called asur at-tadwin they were the 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 period where they were just gathering everything and this is why the hadith they gathered all the hadith they put them in these collections and they then they left it for the next generation to begin to sort them out so you will find there are sira for average people to read that you can read but then there are sira that only the scholars should read If you read Ibn Ishaq there's things in there that can lead you astray and one of the things that people that are against uh, Islam do is that they take these old sira books and they put stories and they say oh look here this is uh, Islam and there's Muslims getting confused by this so this is what he's warning about that you can't relate these stories unless you're a scholar or a student of a uh, scholar and you understand that not all of these things are accurate and um the early ulama were very honest in their uh, collection of all these things but this is not normative islam normative islam comes later uh, where everything is sorted out and this happens in fiqh so you will have fiqh positions that are completely insane in in some of the early period you'll find these in the books because they just collected them and they put them in the books but they're not the 
positions that the schools take. So if I take a position uh, uh, out of context and say, oh, here, this is what the Maliki say. No, that's what one Maliki said, and they call it Hafwa or Zalla. It's a, a mistake. And the Hafwa al Ulama, the Zalla al Ulama are the worst. Ida Zalla al Alim, Zalla al Alam. You know, the Ulama say if the, the scholar trips, the whole world trips with him. You know, that his trip is very dangerous because other people are looking at it. So he's warning about that, that it's very important. So this is also important, mentioning what happened between the Sahaba. Unless you're clarifying that each one of them was a mushtahid. So again, you have, you have narratives in the early period and you will find a lot of difference of opinion uh, about what happened for instance between Muawiyah عنه, and Sayyidina Ali عنه. and the certain groups in Islam took certain positions the Sunni position is a position of husn al dhan it's a position of having a good opinion of people and, and that these people were companions and what was in their heart was good it wasn't bad and what one of the things about that early period that you see is that they were human beings and 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 they did go to blows and they did uh, uh, fall into just like families do even people that love each other can end up um, doing terrible things to each other right I mean this is part of the human condition so it's making sure that if you speak about these things and common people shouldn't discuss these things because this is uh, a dangerous thing uh, to go into that and he's warning about that talking about if you're unqualified to do that you should not be doing it because it can be very dangerous and then um, he says uh, and then he says um, uh, so this is a very problematic uh, aspect of of the of the maharam al lisan because basically what he's saying is to a lahan is a there's two types of lahan there's called lahan khafi and there's lahan jelly uh, a lahan jelly is a overtly or egregiously wrong grammar so for instance imam zaid tells about the the khatib who was giving the khutbah and he said you know, that corruption has um, you know there's a hadith uh, there's a verse in the Quran ذهر الفساد في البر والبحر that that corruption has manifest in the uh, in the earth and on the ocean and the man said في البر والبحر in other words he made the what should have been majurur, he made it marfu'. It should have been in the uh, the the uh, genitive case, and he put it in the uh, nominative case. And so one of the people in the masjid said, "Wa al minbaru," and the facade, this corruption, is also on the minbar, right? So the the ulama, al Imam al Hilali says that lahan in the Quran and in the Hadith is actually a kabira. So that's how severe some of the ulama considered it, that it was a kabira. Now, part of that is to prevent people who are not uh, capable uh, to, and this is one of the things Dr. Winter said uh, that giving a, 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 a khutbah. If you, if you have to give a khutbah uh, in Arabic and one of the uh, Umayyad uh, caliphs said that shayyabatni tawaqa' al-lahn ala al-minbar I got gray hairs out of fear of lahn on the minbar you know it made, gave him gray hairs worrying because if you speak in front of uh, people and there's scholars in the audience and there's people that know grammar and you start making grammatical mistakes Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu was asked how you know a man and if he said he said إِذَا تَكَلَّمَا عَرَفْتُهُ مِنْ سَعَتِهِ If he speaks I'll know him immediately وَإِذَا سَكَتَ 
أعرفه بعد يوم. And if he doesn't speak, it'll take me a day to find out, figure out what kind of a person he is, right? But the Sidi Ahmed Zarruq said, الناس أسواق فإذا تكلم الرجل تبين العطار من البيطار That people are like marketplaces, you know, a lot of different types in the marketplace. And he said, if, if a man speaks, it becomes clear who the عطار is, the perfumer or the physician, because in Arabic, عطار means perfumer and it means physician. It becomes clear who the physician is and who the veterinarian is, who treats animals and who treats a man lies hidden under his tongue. You know, Allah says you will know them in the lahn al qawl Like you will know them in, in, the, in the hidden meanings of their, their words. Because people have ostensible uh, meanings and then they have their real meanings. And you will know them in those uh, hidden meanings. So this is what he's saying. Now in the Qur'an... Tajweed is an obligation to learn Tajweed, right? Uh, Imam al Jazri says, Wal akhlu bit Tajweedi hatmun lazimu, manam yujawid al Qurana athimu. That to learn Tajweed is absolutely necessary, and the one that doesn't have Tajweed is athimu, is sinful. And this is agreed upon uh, that if you recite the Quran without Tajweed, and the ulama say it with the Quran, it's khafi and jali that the lahn al-khafi and lahn al-jali uh, are the same in the sinfulness of it. So the, the, the jali uh, mistake would be something where you miss, uh, the i'rab is wrong or the sarf is wrong. So, so you make a, um, you know, in Arabic you have uh, uh, verbs have different haraka in the, the past and in the present and future. And even a lot of scholars make mistakes on those harakat because that's one of the hardest aspects of vocabulary is the verb differences. So uh, a, a, a lahan in sort but sometimes you think it's wrong and then it turns out that it's a, I mean, I, subhanAllah, Shaykh Abdullah bin Bayya, he, whenever he speaks, uh, He'll say something like khadama yakhdumu, you know, that's the way I learned it. But he said khadama yakhdimu, you know, and I heard him say that. And always when he says something, like he's a hujja in logha. If he says it, you know, when he's speaking Arabic, I guarantee you, it's, it's a hujja. And that's rare in this age to find scholars that are actually like a marja a marja in logha, they're a reference point in logha, but that's one of the things, so you can have like khadama yakhdumu and khadama yakhdimu, they can both, so the lahan would be to say khadama yakhdamu, right, like that or something like that, so you can have a, a grammatical mistake or in your i'rab, uh, in the Qur'an, if you make something that should be in the accusative, in the nominative, or you make it in the genitive and put it in the accusative. Those are all called lahan jali. They're egregious grammatical mistakes. And anybody that knows grammar uh, and sarf will recognize them immediately. If you, if you see somebody who, uh, who uh, but with the khafi, this is a matter of people, that if they're trained in tajweed, and then you can be trained in tajweed, but not be like he says in the in the thing. Uh, uh, Imam Al Jazari, uh, he says uh, uh, that in the imra and bifakihi, wa ma bain hada wa bain tarkihi illa riyadatu imra and bifakihi. You know that the only difference between somebody who uh, can do tajweed and the one who doesn't is the practice of the jaw like you actually have to practice tajweed so you can learn the ahkam many North African when, when I was younger and when I first went to Morocco you heard a lot of the ulama reciting Quran incorrectly in Morocco it was very common uh, because they would pronounce it the way their darija was. And even some, of, if you hear the early, the 1950s Quran reciters that were on the radio in Morocco, they don't put them on anymore. 
because they'll say things like tullatun min al awwalina wa tullatun min al akhir you know they pronounce the quran the way the moroccans so there has been a revival of tajweed which is one of the signs of the end of time also uh, is uh, the prophet predicted that he said the hudud of the quran would go and the huruf would become very everybody would be yuhafidun ala hurufihi wa yudayyuna hududuhu they would be very vigilant about the pronunciations, but they wouldn't practice the rules. That's one of the signs of the end of time. So now you have a revival of Tajweed all over. There are many people because of the radio, they learn Tajweed just from talaqi from the radio because they hear great Quran reciters. So you're finding an Egyptian taxi driver who sounds exactly like a Husari when he's recite. It's amazing and I've seen this. It's really quite amazing that that's happened. So learning Tajweed is something you have to take a teacher to do that, right? And, uh, and he, uh, he says that وَهُوَ عَطَى الْحُرُوفِ حَقَّهَا مِنْ صِيفَةً لَهَا وَمُسْتَحَقَّهَا That the Tajweed is giving every harf its due, every letter gets its due, and then, uh, fr and also the, the sifa, and then it gets its mustahaq. So it gets what it's due in its attributes, its qualities, the qualities of the harf. So every harf has a makhraj, it has a point of articulation. So you have like the, uh, you have five basic points of articulation that you have. You don't have to learn these by heart, like the jawf and the halq and the lisan and the shafatan and the khayshum. You don't have to learn those by heart, but you have to sit with somebody who will teach you how to pronounce them to make sure you're pronouncing them right. So you might not know that the ghayn is a harf halq and it's, one, it's from the adna, right? You, you might not know that. So the khaf and the kha and the ghayn are from the adna halq. You might not know that, but you have to be able to know how to pronounce it properly. So when you say ghaba or khadiduna, when I first met Dr. Omar, maybe like, 32 years ago, I think, we were talking, I was, I was like Shab Plubby, and he was already, mashallah, with his Heba, you know, I was like, I was in awe of him, and, but I, re I remember I said, mentioned to him something about Khalid ibn Walid, and Dr. Omar said to me, Hamza, don't say Khalid, like the modern Arabs say, say Khalid, because that's Haruf Mufakhama. Right, so that was my, that was how I learned that Khalid was a harf mufakhama from Dr. Omar when I was a young boy, alhamdulillah. So, and he, you, when you listen to Dr. Omar in his recitation or his pronunciation, you can hear the makharij because he learned those and he took them very seriously. Wishtahada, and so when he speaks, he has, you have fasaha and balagha. Fasaha is proper uh, pronunciation and then balagha is eloquence and so some scholars can have fasaha but they don't have balagha and some have balagha but they don't have fasaha and some have both they, they have a proper pronunciation which is not tashadduq also tashadduq is the Prophet ﷺ did not like mutashaddiqun and he he warned about them and the mutashaddiqun are people that exaggerate in their articulation so it's it's too much um, one of the phenomenon of modern Arab television, whenever they portray uh, people of the past, great people of the past, they always portray them as mutashaddiqun. Uh, they, they make them talk in a very pompous way. And it's hard to imagine the, those people were like that at all. But that's a common misconception about it, the way they pronounce. So elocution is important and how you speak uh, proper pronunciation, all of these things in Islamic tradition, these were very important things and they were learned. Makharij al huruf were very important. And uh, learning these now is almost all of our communities have people that are qualified to teach, but you have to go and sit with them. And the bare minimum is to know al Fatiha properly because there's a very strong opinion if your Fatiha is not right, your whole prayer is not right. And uh, many, especially some of the Shafi'i, uh, scholars, they will just go and pray again if they pray behind somebody that they think had a lahn in his uh, fatiha. So that's really important. Uh, 
you know, some of the ulam ma made dispensations for ajam, uh, who d did their best to learn, and, and I'll get in that in a second. So I want to say it's very important to go and learn tajweed, to learn the, the makharaj al-huruf, the, there's 17 makharaj, makharaj you know, and, 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 and so you learn the, and the attributes of the huruf, they have sifat, every, every harf has a sifa, and, or more than one, right? And so you learn those. And it, again, you don't have to learn the names, like you don't have to learn the lane or the tefeshi or the takarrar or tikrar. You don't have to learn the name, but you have to know how to pronounce the ra. You know, so some people trill the, the ra in the qira'a, and it's not trilled. The harfu takarrar is to avoid that trill. So you learn that, and then you practice it. Some people can never get it. Uh, so that if they learn the rule and they and they just have a ujma, a difficulty in their tongue, that's not their fault, and that's ma'adur, it's excused. And and then you have to learn the the mustahaq, which is what happens when the the letter gets into a certain situation. So you have uh, you have the iqlab and you have the ikhfa and you have the idgham and and uh, and the idhar. And so this is what happens when. Uh, you have words come together. Siraja uh, wahaja. So you know that there's an idgham there, right? Because of the wow and the yarmaloon are the idgham letters. And you have idgham bi gunna, idgham bi la gunna. Learning these things and knowing how to apply them. And so that is, he's warning us about lahn. If you should not be reading the Quran until you learn tajweed, you're actually, it's, it's sinful. So there's people thinking they're getting a reward reading the Qur'an and they haven't learned how to read it properly. And that's why the Qur'an is taken from teachers. You have to take the Qur'an from teachers and learn from teachers. But everybody should do this. And now in terms of the hadith, and then also the mudud, that was the last. You know, the mudud, uh, learning the... the uh, there are certain mudud, like the madd al -lazim, you know, there's people that say what Abdalin, just like that, and that's you're in trouble, because the Fatiha you cannot say what Abdalin, you have to have a medlazim, right? Because it's muthaqal, so you have to say what Abdalin, you have to give it a, a, a full med, and these are things that are learned. It's not hard. One of the easiest sciences of the of the uh, the ulum al-shari'ah is tajweed. It's really, it's not a difficult science. The, the practicum is difficult, but the actual learning it. And then and that's why you just, and that's why the Prophet Sallallahu praised the, the mahir, al-maharatu bil Quran, and then he praised the one that has difficulty reciting it. He actually said they have two rewards, but they have to learn from the mahir. And if so, if you learn from the mahir and you have difficulty pronouncing things, you're getting double the reward because of that difficulty. So this is the beauty of Islam. But you have to have the ishtihad. If you don't struggle to learn it, then uh, you haven't done anything. So just learning that is really important. Uh, and then in the hadith, generally the ulama say that the hadith, you just avoid the, the lahan uh, jali, the lahan khafi, is, uh, is different because the hadith, the, the, the hadith does not have to be recited with tajweed. But you will notice that the muhaqqiqun from the ulama will recite the, the hadith with tajweed. You'll see this. Because the, the tajweed are the rules of elocution in the Arabic language. This is, this is simply the way that the Prophet ﷺ would have spoken with tajweed even in his hadith during that time. The tajweed is not specific to the Qur'an, it's specific to Arabic, the Arabic language. So it is a lahan uh, khafi to speak without uh, tajweed. Right? But in terms of hadith, it can be quoted as long as it's not a lahan jali. Imam al-Hakim said that he feared that the one who quoted a hadith and quoted it grammatically incorrect would fall under the prohibition in which the Prophet ﷺ said, Man kadaba min an -nar. That whoever tells a lie on me, let him take his seat in the hellfire. He actually considered, he said that he was worried 
that a person who misquoted a hadith and quoted it grammatically incorrect would fall under that category. And, th and this is to protect the religion. You see, this is to protect it from غير أهله you know, from the people that are not the, 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 the right people. And this is one of the things about uh, learning Arabic. It takes a while to learn it. And you have to study it. And learning hadith and these things, are, you can't take them from books. If you take hadith from books, you'll, you'll get them wrong. I mean, the books are filled with mistakes. The Quran, alhamdulillah, doesn't have mistakes, but you still have to learn how to pronounce it. And the rasam uh, is particularly uh, problematic because it doesn't, it's not phonetic rasam all the time. The actual orthographics of the Quran are not written like that. So this is a really important aspect and it should not be uh, in any way uh, just underemphasized. It's a really important aspect of our religion. Uh, if you don't know a hadith, uh, he's going to get to the section about quoting with meaning, but if you, if you haven't studied Arabic and you don't know the marfu'at, the mansubat, and the majrurat, and you don't know these, these rules, then you really have no business reading uh, the, the hadith literature. You just, you don't. Because you will fall into major error. And uh, the scholastic, this is not a priestly class, the scholastic uh, class of Muslims is open to anybody who's willing to put in the time and the effort. Anybody can join that group of people. And you could be a talib ilm uh, by setting out and taking it seriously. But if you're not, you're a ammi. And you have to know that and, and recognize that and just be humble. And, and uh, you know, all of us need to know where, what, what our place is vis-a-vis in, in, uh, -vis this tradition because it's a guarded tradition, it's a protected tradition, and these are the things that protect it. And if we ignore these things and take them lightly, this is how uh, it, it loses its way and uh, it becomes very dangerous. So the, uh, that's what he says about that. And then hadru is a type of recitation, but he says, you know, you have tahqiq, uh, tartil, and you have uh, the tartil hadar, and, and then you have the tawassat uh, between the two. So in, in the, uh, the, the tartil is a very slow uh, recitation. And then the tadwir is a moderate recitation, uh, recitation. And the hadar is a fast recitation. And they call it also hadh. Um, Imam Madik uh, didn't like it and warned against it because the mistakes are much easier to make when you recite fast. If you go, waratil al-Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَرَتِّلِ الْقُرْآنَ تَرْتِيلًا Right? That, رَتِّلِ الْقُرْآنَ That's the command in the Qur'an. And the best recitation is to go slowly with the Qur'an. It also helps tadabbur. It helps you to reflect on the Qur'an. But hadr is a permissible recitation, especially for somebody who wants to do a khatam of Qur'an. Uh, it's much easier to do it uh, like that. Um, so you don't, you can take, because you have situations where you can do two, uh, you, you can have a med with two or four or six, and so you just take the shortest one, right? So you can say, Sawa'un alayhimu an dartuhumu amnam tun You can do it like that, and that's a tartil, it takes a long time. Or you can do Sawa'un alayhimu an like that, and just do it faster uh, recitation. So what he's saying is hadru li lathi alfadhihi ma yajurru if it causes you to cause the alfadh to get mixed together so you can't distinguish uh, and you're not doing the things then it's incorrect uh, and that's very important so it's I, it's you know, I really want to emphasize this point that it's really an important aspect of our religion and and one of the things about these people these were all ulama Allah yarhamuhum here, these were great ulama. Uh, uh, all of them were masters of the tradition. Like they all knew Arabic, they knew Turkish, they knew Persian. They could all, ma many of them probably, some of them probably knew the Masnawi by heart, but they would have all been Hufad al Quran, masters of grammar, all these things. These people were people of itqan, and that's the difference between uh, the, the current people and the people of the past. The people of the past were people of itqan. And this is why we have preserved this tradition. 
the, the, the calligraphy is an amazing uh, tradition. I mean, if you go to these master calligraphers, the, it's all measured perfectly. And it takes years to master. Arabic takes a long time to learn it really well. It takes, it's, people can read, like, alhamdulillah, most, uh, uh, most of the scholars are proficient readers, but to speak Arabic in classical Arabic is very difficult. It's not that easy. Um, and even ulama, you will meet a lot of ulama that are not masterful speakers of Arabic. I, mean, I knew one of the greatest uh, Shafi'i fuqaha living and if, if, if he spoke, people used to think he was just a common person. Uh, he was in Mecca and he was brilliant and his mastery of Arabic was amazing but he did not speak Fusha. He spoke a very, uh, uh, he just spoke a Yemeni dialect uh, when he spoke. And his writing is amazing. He writes like he was from the 5th century. So some of the ulama will be very, very uh, poor in their spoken language. You will find that. But they, they know the Arabic very well. And then he says, uh, It's also prohibited to comment on either the Quran or the Hadith uh, by your opinion, in other words, a rational type commentary or a literal type commentary, uh, if you don't know about the, the senad in the, the, the verse. And this is called the, uh, the, the tafsir bin naql, because you have tafsir bin naql and tafsir bin aql. Tafsir bin naql is the commentaries on the Quran that come from the tradition. So the Prophet, وسلم, one of the shortest chapters in the hadith collections are the chapters that relate to tafsir and the reason for that is obviously if the Prophet ﷺ told us what the Quran meant who could ever say it meant anything else after that nobody would 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 even attempt to say it meant something else so the Prophet ﷺ his life is a commentary of the Qur'an. His behavior is a commentary on the Qur'an. He did not, um, he did not tell us uh, what, what uh, things meant specifically because one, it's in the Arabic language and so people know what, what, what the Arabic language is. It's a preserved language. But you have to learn, the Imam Asiyuti says, you must learn the tafsir of zahir before you can uh, begin to look at other meanings, possible meanings of the Qur'an. So you have to look at what the earliest people said, especially people like uh, Ibn Abbas, Tarjuman al-Qur'an, uh, Ikrimah, uh, uh, Tawus, uh, these are the great, the, there are several of the early people that were considered masters. And then Imam al-Tabari is one of the early great uh, collectors of all of the naql. And so learning a, a, a tafsir like that, and this is why Imam Siyuti's the Jalalain, which is uh, the two Jalaluddin's and Mahallin Siyuti, who did a commentary on the Quran, that gives you a basic meaning of the Quran. You have to learn a basic tafsir before you can go into. And, and so he's saying you cannot comment with the aqad, but it doesn't mean you cannot make a commentary on the Quran. The meanings of the Quran are endless. They will continue uh, to be endless, but you have to do it uh, with an understanding of what the, the, the naql says so that you don't make a mistake. Because if you see, uh, for instance, uh, the talh in the Quran and mandud, I mentioned this the other day, that it's an acacia tree. So if, I, if, if just my knowledge of Arabic, I know that talh is an acacia tree, and there's the Quran says talh, but in the Quran that's not the acacia tree, it's a banana. And how do we know that? Because that's what the uh, Salaf told us. And they knew this Quran uh, better than anybody did. And so you have to look what they said. So if they tell you it means this, then that's what it means. And, uh, and Kanud is an example of that, uh, where uh, Ibn Abbas didn't know what it meant. And then he heard a Bedouin and he, uh, he understood what it meant from that. But that's uh, transmitted down. Ka'ihn al-manfush. Ibn Mas'ud used to say uh, al-manfush when he went to al-Iraq because ihn was a Qurayshi word which meant dyed wool. 
Whereas the other Arabs didn't use that. They just said suf and masbugh. If it was dyed, they would just call it. They didn't have a specific word. So ehen means uh, dyed wool. And, 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 and that, that comes through, the, the, it's transmitted through these scholars. And then he says, uh, This is another real big problem in the modern time. Raising the voice when the Quran is being recited or when the hadith. Like for instance today, and it's a problem because like I got in the bus and the, they had, the driver had the Quran radio on and I asked him to turn it off because either you listen to Quran or you can talk but you can't do both if the Quran is playing and now they put it in uh, restaurants you know you go to these um, the religious owners of the restaurants and so they put Quran while people are eating and having conversations it's unbelievable like the early people would have never done anything like that they would have never done anything like like the Quran is background music or something. I mean that that would be like kufr for them to do that. So unfortunately, this is out of the ignorance that that people don't know these rulings. But you cannot speak. You should not speak when the adhan is being recited. You should not speak when the, the Prophet ﷺ, when the adhan was right. They said that is as if we didn't know him. He completely changed. Because that's nida Allah. It's God calling you, and it's like, imagine your, you know, your father is calling you, and you're just sitting there ignoring his call and continuing on in your conversation. If you had filial piety, you would run to your father if he called you, right? And that's why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Fasawira dikri lahi wa darul bi'a," right? When the salah is called, just sa'i is to go fast, sa'a, to go fast, go quickly to the dhikr of Allah and leave whatever is preoccupying you. In this case, bay'at, which is prohibited during once Juma starts, you can't have any transaction. So that's one of the things that people forget. Imam Madik uh, said that his hurma وسلم, during his lifetime is the same as it is uh, uh, after he leaves the, the, this uh, realm that we're in now. Once the Prophet وسلم, transitioned into the Barzakh, his hurma is the same. And so Imam Madik, if he was quoting a hadith, nobody could talk while he was quoting that hadith. So if somebody is quoting a hadith, you should stop. Now we have, have dinner and people have food in their mouth and they're quoting hadith. Imam Madik was once walking with a man and he said, the man asked him about a hadith and he said, Kuntu arba ubika, you know, I used to have a high, higher opinion of you. He said, I never thought you'd ask about a hadith while we were walking. I mean, this was the level that these people were at. And, you know, more, I mean, we're, this is our time. We're, you know, Allah put us in this time. But we should do our best, you know, really. Because these, this is why they were so elevated. I mean, this is why they created the civilizations that they created. Because they were those type of people. They were very serious people. And the Imam Madik, you know, one of the things now people teach fiqh, you know, and, and, and people that say, what's your dalil? Like you tell them a hukum, you say, you know, that uh, wudu has seven fara'il. You know, wudu has seven uh, obligations. And then somebody will say, what's your dalil, brother? In other words, what's the ayah or the hadith that you get that from? Imam Madik never taught hadith with fiqh. And you can read the mudawana from beginning to end, you will rarely find any hadith in there. Because he had a separate majlis for hadith. When he did the hadith, he would take ghusl, he would put on new, like a clean clothes that had been washed before that. He would make bakhur, he would put the, the aloes wood in the majlis, and then he would come and sit, and he would give the hadith. And when he finished, that was, that was the end of the majlis. When he taught fiqh, it was a different day, separate thing. Fiqh and hadith were not put together because the, the hadith was such a high thing to them. They really exalted the hadith of the Prophet uh, It's recorded, Qad Iyad mentions this in the Tartib al-Madarak, that Imam Madik was bit several times by a scorpion and people saw it. 
And they were in such awe in his majlis. He was called Amir al-Mu'minin fil hadith because it was like being in the presence of an Amir. People did not talk in his majlis. They were very, very sensitive about this. I mean, some ulama, you know, people are different. But Imam Malik had a very strong heba. Uh, he was Umari in his nature. And he had a very strong, uh, awe-inspiring presence. But he got bit by a scorpion and he didn't move. And, and, and nobody could do anything. And then afterwards, somebody went to him when they finished the majlis. And he said, I saw what happened. And he said, you know, you, could, you should have just left. The, you could have stopped. And he said, Sabartu haybatin li hadithi rasulidah. I was patient out of my awe for the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. They said that his color used to change when the Prophet ﷺ's name was mentioned. The color of his face changed. I mean, these people really, people... So this is what he's saying. This is what he's talking about. Don't raise your voice when... If, if, if the Imam is reciting Quran after the Jumu'ah, don't... Why are you having a conversation right next to... What are we doing? What, what, why has this become, you know, فَطَالَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِالْأَمَدُ فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ فَكِثِيرٌ مِّنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ You know, Allah says that time passed and their hearts became hard. This had no effect on them. And then they end up going out. They just become something else. So this is really important about this. A thing with dhikr bin ma'thuri fi hukmihima and also dhikr when you do dhikr like subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanallah al azim also dhikr should be done with tajweed people do awrad and things like that you should do the awrad with tajweed and and you should also do the dhikr as it was given to us by the prophet sallallahu you should not change it uh, the hadith can be transmitted in meaning, some of them, not the Jawami al karim he'll get to that. But the, uh, the dhikr that comes down should be said the way that it's taught. And, uh, and also when, when it has the same hukum of the Quran and the hadith, the dhikr bil ma'thur. Rawi a hadith Jawami al karim aw al ta'abudi bi ma'naha atham. So the, the one who is reciting the, uh, the Jawami al kalam and these are the hadiths like La Darara wa La Dirar. That's a Jami' uh, uh, jami uh, uh, It's a comprehensive word. The Prophet ﷺ said things like Ad-Deenu Nasiha. Religion is, Nasiha can mean sincerity, it can mean good counsel, it means different things. It's, it's a comprehensive word itself. That hadith, you could do a whole book just on two words. And Siri Ahmed Zarruq did a whole book on that. Um, you can do a whole book on Karimatani, Khafifatani, Ala Lisani, Thaqiratani, Filmizani, Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi, Subhanallahi al Azim. These are light words on the tongue, heavy words in the scale. These, the Jawami al Kalam, are those things that the Prophet ﷺ related that, that have these, uh, these meanings. So, uh, and also those things that are for ta'abud, like Sayyid al-Istighfar. There's a Sayyid al-Istighfar, Allahumma inni yasiruka, also Allahumma inni yasiruka min fuja'at al-khayri, wa a'udhu bikum min fuja'at al-sharri. These are things for ta'abud, and so you should recite them uh, and pro uh, appropriately, and if you, uh, you don't, and if you recite them with their meaning, then it's sinful. That's what he's saying. Don't do them by their meaning. فِي الْغَيْرِ لِلْدَّارِ بِمَدْلُولَاتِ الْأَلْفَاضِ أَنْ يَرْوِيَ بِالْمَعْنَاتِ so he's saying, but other than those, for the one who's daddy, yidri, he knows the meanings of words. So if you have hadith that, you know, one, one thing I noticed about Shaykh Abdullah bin Dayya, because I've translated for him for several years now, um, he, he, mashallah, he, he memorizes, uh, I, I was once translating for him, and he, he, um, he related a hadith, uh, he, he'll relate a hadith with meaning. I've seen him do this many times. He doesn't give the exact thing, he just gives a meaning. And he related a hadith once, and he said, هذا من طرف الحديث, you know, it's just part of the hadith. And, uh, uh, and then when, when we were, after we went back, you know, and I, and I was in the room with him, and I said, سيدي الحديث ذكرته من صحيح مسلم. He said, نعم. He said, 
ايش الحديث قالوا طويل he said it's a long hadith you know I said ممكن نسمعه he went maybe two pages just from his memory like, so he could do that if he wants but he doesn't he just he takes what he needs you know what's what's the like the doctor you know he just takes what he needs for that specific situation and does that and and so you can do that if you know the madlulat uh, and and then an yarwiya bil ma'nati bil ma'na al ma'nati is a shad logha for ma'na and he just does it for the wazan so you can do that and then he says woman rawa mukhtalaqan wa lam yubin lin nasi wad'uhu bi isyanin qamin so if you relate something that is mukhtalaq in other words, it's mawdu'a, it's a fabricated hadith, then, and you don't clarify that to people, uh, it's basically, it's a ma'asiyah, it's disobedience. And it could go under a very dangerous category of lying about the Prophet. So if you know uh, something is, uh, the ulama, generally one of the bad signs of this age is this uh, attack on weak hadith. You know, there's a, uh, this, this whole movement to, uh, expurgate the weak hadith from the collections. In fact, some people even redid the collections by taking out all the what they thought were the weak hadith in the collections, and and so doing uh, Abu Dawood Sunan without weak hadith. And this this is a something that many of the muhaddithun said was uh, innovative because the weak hadith are accepted by the ulama. They have a lower grade. But they're accepted, and in Fadail al Amal, they're very important. Um, and uh, many, many of the Fadail, the virtuous acts that people do, are based on these weaker hadith. So it's very important uh, in Wa'av, if somebody's doing exhortation, they can use a weak hadith as long as it's not extremely weak and they know it's weak and it doesn't have a uh, legal ruling related to it other than Fadail al Amal. Because there's hadith, for instance, in Birr al Waridain, taking good care of your parents. There's hadith about that that are very important. And they're not Sahih, but they're very powerful. And so a, a Wa'il has permission to use those, and he doesn't have to clarify that they're weak. Because it can, people th hear weak and they just think it's like, doesn't mean anything, but it is. It's, it's, a, a weak hadith is from like a, a B minus to a, you know, a D. It's not an F, it didn't flunk, it's, it's, it passed the grade. And so the probability that the Prophet ﷺ said it is higher than that he didn't. Right? So just to reject it, you could be rejecting something the Prophet ﷺ said, which you know, the ulama never did. But in terms of the legal rulings, the weak hadith are something different. So what he's saying is you should clarify when you recite uh, something. And some, even some of the mawdu'ats are wisdoms. مَنْ عَرَفَ رَبَّهُ فَقَدْ مَنْ عَرَفَ نَفْسُهُ فَقَدْ عَرَفَ رَبَّهُ That is, I wouldn't put it under the mawdu'a category, but, but um, you know, the, a lot of ulama spoke about that hadith. Um, and Imam al-Ajzuni relates it in his book and actually argues that uh, some of the people that related it were big uh, muhaddithun and but the senate we don't have a clear senate for that uh, and and so that's a situation where it's important to clarify that or kuntu kanzan makhfiya for instance and a lot of the sufi hadiths that are taken very seriously in tasawwuf might not have a senate some of the ulama say yu'rafu kashfan you know that it's known by kashf and that's not a hukam, that's not a legal judgment for hadith literature. Um, it, it, it doesn't mean that it's not true for the individual because they could have that knowledge, but, but um, it, doesn't, it doesn't hold water with the, we have a very rigorous criteria that the ulama gave us to determine whether something's uh, sound or not. And so he says that, you know, if you don't do that. And then he says, شَرْعُ أَبَحَا كَلْمَا خَصَصَ فِي تَحْرِيمِهِ أو So this is, uh, it's also prohibited to make something haram that Allah subhanahu wa made halal for you, like water or something like that. So حَرَّمْتُ عَلَى نَفْسِيَ اللَّبَنِ Things like that. 
والأمر بالذنب وأن يحدث بكل ما سمعه أو 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 يملثا. So he's he's saying here basically that there's a hadith in the in the Sahih Muslim that he begins kafa bin mar i kadiba an yuhadditha bi kulli ma sami'a. So it's enough to consider a man a liar that he relates everything he hears. And one of the things that you'll see in in hadith literature is when they call people liars, they don't always mean intentional liars, right? But they meant that they didn't, they, they, they related hadith without ascertaining. They just heard it and they transmitted it on. So in Arabic, a lie is intentional or unintentional. If it's intentional, it's obviously worse. But if you, if you say something that you have no right to say, and you say it as if it's fact, it's considered a lie. Even if you weren't intending to say it as a lie. And that's important to know. That's a distinction between uh, lying in English and lying in. So if you said that, oh, Zaid's in Istanbul, and you don't know Zaid's in Istanbul, but you say it as if it's a fact, it's a lie. Right? And then if you heard, then you have to say, I heard. Zaid is in Istanbul, or so and so told me Zaid is this. Then you put it on the other person. But for you, like say so and so told you, and you haven't ascertained it, and then you relate it as if it's fact. That's that's what they're talking about. That's enough to consider a man a liar who just transmit things that he hears without ascertaining. In ja'akum fasaqum bi naba'in fatabayyanu, and in the qira'a sab'iyya fatathabatu. You know, both. You have to do both. To thabbat, make sure that it, it's, it really did happen, and then to begin, clarify what, what exactly is being said, disambiguation, know what's being said. So you need to do both. You need to know the source, is it true, and then you need to know what does it mean. I mean, those are both really important aspects of language, I'm not doing that. And so, um, And then also uh, he says yamlutha, uh, which is where you, you say something like a promise, but you're not planning on fulfilling it. Right? So that's prohibited to do. Why do you say what you don't do? If you, if you make a wa'd al-mu'min day of sadiq, you have to uh, fulfill. And that used to be uh, really important for people to do that. Uh, to make sure that they were doing. When did you give me that? Because I didn't see that come. Okay, so a few more minutes here. فَمَخِبُرٌ بِغَيْنِ مَا تَظَنَّنَا ثُبُوتُهُ يَجِبُ أَنْ يُبَيِّنَا So that we talked about that just now. That the, that's very important. Just finding out uh, what, what, uh, what's been said. Um, Anyway, these, uh, these rules are, they're rigorous, they're difficult, but this is what will transform a society or a civilization. I mean, if we really took this seriously and practiced these things, it would really change the state. One of the things the Imam the Abu Dawud said that, um, you know, he said, he, he collected uh, 500,000 hadith, 500,000, half a million. And he put the hadith that he collected into his collection. And then he said, but there's only four that, that a Muslim needs to practice. And one of them is, is, uh, is uh, تَرْكُهُمَا لَا يَعْنِيهِ You know, to, to leave what uh, doesn't concern him. You know, the hadith, there's a riwayah musalsala from Malik on أَقْبَلْ عَلَى شَأْنَكْ means mind your own business. And it, uh, Imam Shafi'i asked him, how old are you? And he said, أَقْبَلْ عَلَى شَأْنَكْ you know, mind your own business. And then when, when anybody asked Imam Shafi'i how old he was, he used to say, Aqbal ala sha'anak, mind your own business. You know, fudul is, is a, you know, this curiosity. The Arabs call it fudul. It's, it's the idea that, you know, oh, how much did the house cost? Or how much, those things, 
you know, the, a lot of it's decorum, you know, it's not haram, but it's decorum, and societies are distinguished by the quality of their courtesy. You know, the, um, the Muslims were, were traditionally, and the, Turk, the Turkish society was very much a society of very high decorum, very high protocol. Uh, Syrian society has a lot of that also. It can become stifling, undeniably. If people that know Hyderabadi um, society, Hyderabadi is also, it's a very uh, highly uh, um, great decorum in, in, the, uh, in the society. But those arise out of refinement. That's where they come from. And, um, and again, they can be stifling, and, uh, but they're also, uh, they're, 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 uh, when they're in their proper balance, they're very beautiful and they, and they, they, uh, they give us an aspect of our nature that is very elevating. Uh, in the light of the modern world, and the pro proliferation of information is it important to mention to discuss what happened between companions because of the confusion, all the confusion that is out there. The yeah, no, I, it's a good good point about the internet is a real fitna, undeniably, and it's just so many websites and there's so much information and disinformation and confusion and. So it becomes very difficult, but you end up also being just one more. I mean, what, what I think is what, what, what's important for the Muslims at this stage is to build institutions and then renovate the existing institutions. Al-Azhar is a great institution, and uh, the, the importance of Al-Azhar can't be uh, underestimated. Uh, Al-Azhar, the, the tradition of Al-Azhar, is a great tradition. Uh, it's a scholastic tradition and a spiritual tradition, and it's a normative Islam. It's in, in that sense, it's an orthodoxy. And so that's an institution that really needs to be uh, renovated. And there's people trying to do that, and may Allah give them tawfiq at that. Uh, this is an institution also here, may Allah give them tawfiq. Um, uh, Dr. Rajab and his people that are here in this institution are trying to do a similar thing. Um, they're t these, these are scholars of a very high standard. I mean, you speak to them, they're really, and they're not just scholars of the Islamic tradition. Just sitting the other night with several of them, they, they were speaking French and Turkish and Arabic, and um, you know, they know other languages, they're reading. Uh, modern philosophy, they're really thinking about a lot of things and they know the tradition, they know their tradition and, and uh, so I think building these institutions where orthodoxy uh, and, and by orthodoxy I mean in a broad based sense um, a good definition of tradition um, that I, that I heard was that, that tradition is the living faith of the dead, whereas traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. And unfortunately, there's a lot more traditionalism than there is tradition, because traditionalism becomes ossified. It, it's, it's no longer... Uh, uh, Arnold Toynbee, the great British historian, talks about the creative responses to challenges that civilizations will thrive or decline based on their creative minorities' responses to the challenges that confront them. Uh, America's in one of these situations now. There are massive uh, problems that are confronting the United States and whether or not they're a creative minority, and there still are some really creative people in the United States. There's, there's a, a, a level of scholarship there that's still very impressive, and any, anybody who monitors the books in that culture uh, is very aware of that. There's a lot of thinking still going on in their academic institutions. And because of that, uh, but whether or not they take the advice of these people, is that, that remains to be seen. Um, it's always dangerous to predict uh, the fall of anything. I once said to somebody of, several years back when the Soviet Union was collapsing, I said, how does it feel to be part of a collapsing empire. He said, never underestimate a people whose national pastime is chess. 
<laughs> right? So, wise piece of advice. The Ottomans, they predicted their downfall in the 16th century. They were already talking about they've got 50 years left. So, they went into, my mother was born, there was a caliph. <laughs> my mother, when she was born, there was an Ottoman caliph. It wasn't that long ago, and it's the longest running family dynasty in human history. Is there any other one longer? Is, do you know of any other? Okay. But it's definitely one of them, if not. I mean, 800 years is a long time. Yeah. I mean, the English dynasty, they're like um, spring chickens. The Hanovers. Uh. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, we have to, you know, what's called radd uh, shubuhat, refuting the obfuscations, things that cause doubtful things in the hearts of people is an obligation on scholars in regards to sharhuha uh, birra'i, uh, um, to teach the Quran program that is most made of non-Arab speakers. Since I am fluent in Arabic, I sometimes give them a basic translation to help them memorize. Hmm. Um, is it possible for me to give a basic interpretation? In my case, is it prohibited to do this because of meaning? I mean, again, if, if you haven't studied a tafsir, then you shouldn't be translating the Quran. Because you... You might think you know what it means, but it, it could mean something else. And that happens a lot with hadith. I mean, the, the famous story about the... I mean, there's so many stories like this about the... Uh, Imam Ibn al Jozi wrote a whole book on these stories. Kitab al-Hamqa wa al-Maghafaneen. Like this book of idiots and fools. And it was about people who <laughs> heard something. I mean, Imam... Uh, uh, Imam uh, Muhammad Ramin al-Shinqiti who did the tafsir, he was in Khurtum, in, uh, he was in Omdarman, and he asked this man where he was from, he said, Ana min bilad Mubarak, you know, I'm from a blessed place. He said, what place is that? He said, uh, Khurtum. And he said, what's blessed about it? And he said, Allah, Allah, ya Sheikh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned it in the Quran, Sanasimuhum Ad al Khurtum. You know we're <laughs> So he thought it you know, this is like some you'll meet like some Bedouin people that have names like Fir'aun. Because you know their dad just went in the Quran and looked for a name, like to for Tabarruk. <laughs> he said Fir'aun, that's a good name. So that's an example of that. And he said, you remind me of Mughani al Lusus, the singer of the Lusus, the thieves. He said, who's that? And he said that one of the caliphs caught a bunch of brigands. And so after they had their trial, he ordered them to get their heads cut off. And the, and the last one, he said, that taqta rasi ya amir al-mu'mineen, inna ana mughanihim faqat ma kuntu minhum. He said, don't, don't, <laughs> don't, uh, don't, don't kill me because I, I just used to sing for them. I never joined them. And he said, what did you, give me an example. What did you sing for them? And he said, Don't ask about a man, but ask about the company he keeps because every man is on the company. <laughs> so he said, <laughs> <laughs> you condemned yourself. <laughs> you mentioned that for weak hadith, the probability that the Prophet said it is greater than the probability he did not. Is this true for all weak hadith? It's true for all hadith except for mutawatir hadith. I mean, we forget that even the sahih hadith are probabilistic but the probability becomes very, very high. So if it's in Sahih al-Bukhari, it's, it's going to have like a 95 to 99% probability. And when you get all six agreeing on the hadith, it's very strong. If it's mutawatir, it's factual. It's just like uh, 1066 or 1492. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. 
That's a, that is not a debatable fact. You, you, can't, you, know, you can't debate whether or not it was 1491 or 1493 because it's an agreed upon mutawatir uh, khabar. So it's a factual account of something that happened. And history is like that. Much of history is factual. We know that there was a president in 1960 elected named John Kennedy. He was Irish Catholic. We know those are those are mutawatir. There's no you can't debate those. If you start debating those, then you're just a mad person, like the Hindu PhD who's trying to prove that the Taj Mahal was built by Hindus before Islam. He's got a whole website. You know this is madness. So the mutawatir hadith are like that. You can't, there, the, you can't debate mutawatir hadith. The Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And then you have tawatir al lavdi wa ma'nawi. You have different types of tawatir. So one of them that is mutawatir is naha Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an qatil al awladi, an al nisa'i wal awlad. The Prophet prohibited killing women and children in war. It's prohibited anytime, but it's prohibited in war to kill women and children. And also in, in the riwayah, ajir or non combatant. Right? The only people that are, are people that are fighting. The monarchies took this so seriously that if there's women, because it's permissible if they're fighting you on the battlefield, like now there's certain armies that allow women in combat. So if they're fighting you, it's permissible. But in the monarchy madhab, they took that mutawatir hadith so seriously that they said if you saw a woman on the battlefield, you should avoid fighting her to get out of that prohibition. So don't go, and unless they tried to get you, you should go somewhere else. So, you know, th these are examples. So the, the hadith, the probability is greater or lesser depending on the level of weakness. And some of, you know, people forget some of these muhaddithun, they were thiqa, 100%, because you have to have five criteria for a sahih hadith. And one of them is dabt, that they had to be dabt. Right? So if they, if they had a weak memory, Right? Then they, even though they were trustworthy, but if they had weak, and their weak memory, they'd be like geniuses today. You know, a lot of these people, I mean, the Dabat, Imam al Bukhari, when he went to Iraq and they tested him, they took a hundred different uh, Senad, each Senad had like four or five people in it, they took a hundred and mixed them all around. And then they, they quoted the Hadith to him, and from his memory, he said, those, those hadiths, he said, the first one is not sahih according to that senad, because you related it, this, 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 and this, but it is sahih according to this, and then he corrected it. He did all hundred without making one mistake. And when they saw that, they just said, نُسَلِّمُ لَهُ إِمَامَةَ الْحَدِيثِ You're the imam of this age. They gave that. وَالْمَيَابَ When he went to Al-Azhar, this is a true story. When he went to Al-Azhar, uh, he taught hadith at Al-Azhar, but his, they wanted to test him, and he, when he met all the muhaddithun, he, he said, Ana fulan ibn fulan ibn fulan ibn fulan ibn fulan ibn fulan ibn fulan. And then he gave his whole, he said, who are you? He said, fulan ibn fulan, ibn man, ibn fulan, ibn man, ibn fulan. And they went as far as he could, each one, all the shiukh. He said, uh, you can meet me tomorrow to test me. So the next day when he came back, he said, Salaamu Alaikum Fulan ibn Fulan ibn Fulan ibn Fulan ibn Fulan ibn Fulan. Salaamu Alaikum Fulan ibn Fulan ibn Fulan ibn Fulan. Salaamu Alaikum Fulan ibn Fulan ibn Fulan. And he went through the whole room and then he said, Man ana? You know, who am I? And none of them knew he could do everything. You know. And this, one of the Mauritanian Hufab saw two men get in a fight and they were speaking a Tekuror language, uh, one of Bambara. And, and they had a fight, and, and one of them killed the other. When the police came, he was the only witness. And, and they asked him what happened. He said, you know, I don't speak their language, but he said, and then he quoted him with the words he said in the language, and then he did the other one. And people say that that sounds crazy, but I've, I've, I've met these people. I mean, I've seen it with my own eyes. You know, literally seen it with my own eyes. So that, that's... You know, people don't know the, the, the level of memory that the Muslims were given. They were granted incredible gifts in memory. So, uh, the hadith, you know, there, there are many, many hadith that, uh, that uh, might not be sound, but they're, you know, 
I know people have habits and things like that, but if they have habits like playing with things and things when I'm talking, it just be, it's really distracting for me. It's my own, I, I apologize, but I just, I get distracted easily. Uh, did the Prophet always speak with Tajweed? Tajweed is the, the, the way that the Arabs speak. They speak with Tajweed classically. So Idram was part of the Arabic language. That's the way it's pronounced. Um, and so the Prophet his, his language would have been the way, I mean obviously the Quran is recited in, in a, in a uh, melodic and uh, ritual way. It's been, been ritualized. So they wouldn't have spoken like the Quran is recited, but the rules by which we recite the Quran they would have used. They didn't know those rules. They were just the way they spoke. In the same way, uh, English generally, unless they're from Watford, they'll pronounce water with a T and they pronounce it as a, as a proper dental. Whereas it, I'm from California, we say water. So we, we turn it into a, a, a D. But if you look at the makhraj, ta and da, they're very close. Do you see? So because of that, you'll get these variations in pronunciation. Um, the Arabs, uh, they, they knew how to pronounce their language, the qaf. They all said it from the same makhraj. Bad, uh, Sayyidina Omar could say it on both sides. Generally, you'll say it on the side that you're he was ambidextrous, so he could write, he was adil, you know, he, he was balanced. And that was his nature, but he could pronounce the dad from the left or the right side, dad or dad, right, on either side. A lot of people can't do that, because they'll, but, but, because uh, that's one of the huruf al-lisan, dad. So, um, uh, how should we approach the Quran study circles? I think with a lot of hesitation and deliberation. I think it's important to do tadabbar of the Quran and I think um, there are some good commentaries now in English out there for people that don't know Arabic. I think it is good to read the Quran in, uh, in English. Um, but you have to understand you, you don't get fiqh from Quran, you don't get legal rulings from the Quran, but you, there's a lot of stories in the Quran that you can benefit from. There's uh, there are a lot of uh, things that, um, and it's good to know the Quran. I mean, one of the things about, if you take a devout Christian, a devout Christian knows Genesis. Like they'll tell you, you know, Genesis begins here, it goes there. That they'll give you the thematic aspects of Genesis. They'll know some of the wisdoms or stories. There. If you ask a Muslim, what's Baqarah about? A lot, most Muslims don't know what Baqarah is about, but Baqarah definitely has themes, and those themes are discernible. And, and so studying the Qur'an to, to, to know the book, you're going to, inshallah, be reading it your whole life. So it's definitely worth knowing. It's worth knowing the stories in the Qur'an. Uh, and there are good books now. A lot of these books have been, uh, they're accessible. You have to be careful. Pre-modern tafsirs are problematic. Um, not everything that's in tafsir is valid. And so that's, that's an important aspect of it. And it's good to have, you, you need generally somebody, a student of knowledge uh, to, to be a, um, a study leader or something like that. Because um, one, one, all sects go astray because of misinterpreting the Quran and the Hadith, all of them. There's no sect. In, in the history of Islam that didn't go astray uh, for any other reason. It's always uh, uh, idiosyncratic uh, views on the Quran. And the, and the people that, the mainstream, the people of the plumb line uh, of Islam are the people that stayed within the broad-based interpretive hermeneutic of Islam. There's, there's a, there's a usul. There's usul al logha there's usul al-fiqh, there's usul al-deen, each one of these are interpretive um, tools that are binding upon the people of interpretation. You can't, you can't go outside of them. You cannot, like Shahrur, you know, this uh, man who j just really, really very strange ideas about Quran, but 
the idea that you, you, you free the language from the seventh century, I mean, that's completely insane. And a lot of these debates uh, are very similar to what you ha find in constitutional debates in America, you know, intentionalists, originalists, living constitutionalists. They're very similar ideas. The problems of uh, interpretation are always going to be there. But, but by consensus, Quran can only mean what the Arabic language of the seventh century allows it to mean. It cannot mean linguistically. Spiritual meanings are endless. Though that's a different thing, and, and we'll talk about that in here because he goes into that about isharat and things. The spiritual meanings of the Quran will go on forever, but the linguistic possibilities of those words are limited. For us, in terms of what Allah knows, uh, that's another thing. But for us, we have dictionaries that you can't change. They're fixed. al ain you know, it's fixed. Lisan al-Arab, Zabidi, these are the great dictionaries of the Muslims and the, the words mean what they mean and you can't change those meanings.